This is your host Danny and this is Stories by English Plus podcast. In today's episode I'm going to read to you The Scarlet Ibis by James Hurst. It is a beautiful story, but before we start of course I will introduce the story and give you some background and then we will start. You can find the story if you would like to read while you're listening on my website. There's a link in the description of the episode that will take you to the custom post I created for the story on englishpluspodcast.com. And there is another link of course which is as important that will take you to my Patreon page. I'm counting on your support to save English Plus and to be able to continue. I'm hoping to get 50 supporters by the end of the year which will help me cover the expenses of the podcast and keep it going. So take the link, support me on Patreon and I promise I will put every penny you contribute to good use. As of today I have eight great supporters who I would like to thank very much for contributing and I hope to grow the family even more by the end of the year. And now without further ado, let's start talking about the Scarlet Ibis. Why do we hurt the ones we love? Cruelty can intrude on the most loving relationship, often in moments of anger or disappointment. How do you deal with mixed emotions like these? Adults usually control such urges, but children are more likely to act on their immediate feelings. What harm can come from a thoughtless word or action? Well, this is what I want you to think about while we enjoy the story of the Scarlet Ibis. But before we start, let me give you a little background on James Hurst himself, the writer of this great story. James Hurst lives near the North Carolina coast, not far from the farm where he was born. After attending college and serving in the US Army during World War II, he studied singing at the New York's famous Juilliard School. Hoping for an operatic career, he also studied in Rome, Italy, but soon gave up on this goal. Then in 1951, he settled into a long career at a large New York bank. During his early years at the bank, Hearst published short stories and a play. The Scarlet Ibis received national attention after appearing in the Atlantic Monthly in July 1960 and winning the Atlantic First Award that same year. When asked about the meaning of the story, Hearst once replied, I hesitate to respond since authors often do not understand what they write. That is why we have critics. I venture to say, however, that it comments on the tenacity and the splendor of the human spirit. Now, the Scarlet Ibis takes its title from a tropical bird rarely found in coastal North Carolina, where the story takes place. The lush, natural environment of this setting is prominent in the story. In addition to the Ibis, Hearst uses the local names of plants for the power of their symbolic associations. For example, for example, the exotic ibis lands in a bleeding tree, a type of pine that oozes a white sap when cut. Graveyard flowers are fragrant white gardenias, often planted in cemeteries because they bloom year after year. And now, with that background, we are ready to start with our story, The Scarlet Ibis by James Hurst. It was in the clove of seasons. Summer was dead, but autumn had not yet been born that the ibis lit in the bleeding tree. The flower garden was stained with rotting brown magnolia petals, and ironweed grew rank amid the purple phlox. The five o'clocks by the chimney still marked time, but the oriole nest in the elm was untenated and rocked back and forth like an empty cradle. The last graveyard flowers were blooming, and their smell drifted across the cotton field and through every room of our house, speaking softly the names of our dead. It's strange that all this is still so clear to me, now that the summer has long since fled and time has had its way. A grindstone stands where the bleeding tree stood, just outside the kitchen door, and now if an oriole sings in the elm, its song seems to die up in the leaves as silvery dust. The flower garden is prim, the house a gleaming white, and the pale fence across the yard stands straight and spruce. But sometimes, like right now, as I sit in the cool green draped parlor, the grindstone begins to turn, and time, with all its changes, is ground away, 
and I remember Doodle. Doodle was just about the craziest brother a boy ever had. Of course, he wasn't a crazy crazy like old Miss Lady, who was in love with President Wilson and wrote him a letter every day, but was a nice crazy, like someone you meet in your dreams. He was born when I was six and was, from the outset, a disappointment. He seemed all head, with a tiny body which was red and shriveled like an old man's. Everybody thought he was going to die. Everybody except Aunt Nicey, who had delivered him. She said he would live because he was born in a coal, and coals were made from Jesus' nightgown. Daddy and Mr. Heath, the carpenter, built a little mahogany coffin for him. But he didn't die. And when he was three months old, Mama and Daddy decided they might as well name him. They named him William Armstrong, which was like tying a big tail on a small kite. Such a name sounds good only on a tombstone. I thought myself pretty smart at many things, like holding my breath, running, jumping, or climbing the vines in Old Woman's Swamp, and I wanted more than anything else someone to race to Horsehead Landing, someone to box with, and someone to perch with in the top fork of the great pine behind the barn, where across the fields and swamps you could see the sea. I wanted a brother, but Mama, crying, told me that even if William Armstrong lived, he would never do these things with me. He might not, she sobbed, even be all there. He might, as long as he lived, lie on the rubber sheet in the center of the bed in the front bedroom where the white marquisette curtains billowed out in the afternoon sea breeze, rustling like palmetto fronds. It was bad enough having an invalid brother, but having one who possibly was not all there was unbearable so I began to make plans to kill him by smothering him with a pillow. However, one afternoon as I watched him, my head poked between the iron posts of the foot of the bed. He looked straight at me and grinned. I skipped through the rooms, down the echoing halls, shouting, Mama! He smiled! He's all there! He's all there! And he was. When he was two, if you laid him on his stomach, he began to move himself, straining terribly. The doctor said that with his weak heart, this strain would probably kill him, but it didn't. Trembling, he'd push himself up, turning first red and a soft purple and finally collapsed back onto the bed like an old worn-out doll. I can still see Mama watching him, her hand pressed tight across her mouth, her eyes wide and unblinking. But he learned to crawl. It was his third winter. And we brought him out of the front bedroom, putting him on the rug before the fireplace for the first time he became one of us. As long as he lay all the time in bed, we called him William Armstrong, even though it was formal and sounded as if we were referring to one of our ancestors. But with his creeping around on the deerskin rug and beginning to talk, something had to be done about his name. It was I who renamed him. When he crawled, he crawled backward as if he were in reverse and couldn't change gears. If you called him, he'd turn around as if he were going in the other direction. Then he'd back right up to you and be picked up. Crawling backward made him look like a doodle bug, so I began to call him Doodle. And in time, even Mama and Daddy thought it was a better name than William Armstrong. Only Aunt Nicey disagreed. She said coal babies should be treated with special respect since they might turn out to be saints. Renaming my brother was perhaps the kindest thing I ever did for him, because nobody expects much from someone called Doodle. Although Doodle learned to crawl, he showed no signs of walking, but he wasn't idle. He talked so much that we all quit listening to what he said. It was about this time that Daddy built him a go-kart and I had to pull him around. At first, I just paraded him up and down the piazza, but then he started crying to be taken out into the yard and it ended up by my having to lug him wherever I went. If I so much as picked up my cap, he'd start crying to go with me, and Mama would call from wherever she was, Take Doodle with you! He was a burden in many ways. The doctor had said that he mustn't get too excited, too hot, too cold, or too tired, and that he must always be treated gently. A long list of don'ts went with him, all of which I ignored once we got out of the house. 
To discourage his coming with me, I'd run with him across the ends of the cotton rows and careen him around corners on two wheels. Sometimes I accidentally turned him over, but he never told Mama. His skin was very sensitive, and he had to wear a big straw hat whenever he went out. When the going got rough and he had to cling to the sides of the go-kart, the hat slipped all the way down over his ears, he was a sight. Finally, I could see I was licked. Doodle was my brother, and he was going to cling to me forever no matter what I did. So I dragged him across the burning cotton field to share with him the only beauty I know, Old Woman Swamp. I pulled the go-kart through the sawtooth fern down into the green dimness where the palmetto fronds whispered by the stream. I lifted him out and set him down in the soft rubber grass beside a tall pine. His eyes were round with wonder as he gazed about him, and his little hands began to stroke the rubber grass. Then he began to cry. For heaven's sake, what's the matter? I asked, annoyed. It's so pretty, he said. So pretty, pretty, pretty. After that day, Doodle and I often went down into Old Woman's Swamp. I would gather wildflowers, wild violets, honeysuckle, yellow jasmine, snake flowers, and water lilies, and with wire grass, we'd weave them into necklaces and crowns. We'd bedeck ourselves with our handiwork and lullabout thus beautified beyond the touch of the everyday world. Then when the slanted rays of the sun burned orange in the tops of the pines, we'd drop our jewels into the stream and watch them float away toward the sea. There is within me, and with sadness I have watched it in others, a knot of cruelty borne by the stream of love. Much as our blood sometimes bears the seed of our destruction, and at times I was mean to doodle. One day, I took him up to the barn loft and showed him his casket, telling him how we all had believed he would die. It was covered with a film of Paris green sprinkled to kill the rats, and screech owls had built a nest inside it. Doodle studied the mahogany box for a long time, then said, It's not mine. It is, I said. And before I'll help you down from the loft, you're going to have to touch it. I won't touch it, he said sullenly. Then I'll leave you here by yourself. I threatened and made as if I were going down. Doodle was frightened of being left. Don't go leave me, brother, he cried, and he leaned toward the coffin. His hand trembling reached out, and when he touched the casket, he screamed. A screech owl flapped out of the box into our faces, scaring us and covering us with Paris green. Doodle was paralyzed, so I put him on my shoulder and carried him down the ladder, and even when we were outside in the bright sunshine, he clung to me, crying, Don't leave me! Don't leave me! When Doodle was five years old, I was embarrassed at having a brother of that age who couldn't walk. So I set out to teach him. We were down in Old Woman's Swamp, and it was spring and the sick, sweet smell of bay flowers hung everywhere like a mournful song. I'm going to teach you to walk, Doodle, I said. He was sitting comfortably on the soft grass, leaning back against the pine. Why? he asked. I hadn't expected such an answer. So I won't have to haul you around all the time. I can't walk, brother, he said. Who says so? I demanded. Mama, the doctor, everybody. Oh, you can walk, I said, and I took him by the arms and stood him up. He collapsed onto the grass like a half-empty flower sack. It was as if he had no bones in his little legs. Don't hurt me, brother, he warned. Shut up. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to teach you to walk. I heaved him up again, and again he collapsed. This time, he did not lift his face up out of the rubber grass. I just can't do it. Let's make honeysuckle wreaths. Oh, yes, you can, Doodle, I said. All you gotta do is try. Now, come on. And I hold him up once more. It seemed so hopeless from the beginning that it's a miracle I didn't give up. But all of us must have something or someone to be proud of, and Doodle had become mine. I did not know then that pride is a wonderful, terrible thing, a seed that bears two vines, life and death. Every day that summer we went to the pine beside the stream of Old Woman Swamp, and I put him on his feet at least a hundred times each afternoon. Occasionally I too became discouraged because it didn't seem as if he was trying, and I would say, Doodle, don't you want to learn to walk? 
He'd nod his head and I'd say, Well, if you don't keep trying, you'll never learn. Then I'd paint him a picture of us as old men, white-haired, him with a long white beard, and me still pulling him around in the go-kart. This never failed to make him try again. Finally, one day, after many weeks of practicing, he stood alone for a few seconds. When he fell, I grabbed him in my arms and hugged him, her laughter purling through the swamp like a ringing bell. Now we knew it could be done. Hope no longer hid in the dark palmetto thicket, but perched like a cardinal in the lacy toothbrush tree, brilliantly visible. Yes! Yes, I cried, and he cried it too. And the grass beneath us was soft and the smell of the swamp was sweet. With success so imminent, we decided not to tell anyone until he could actually walk. Each day, barring rain, we sneaked into Old Woman's Swamp, and by cotton-picking time, Doodle was ready to show what he could do. He still wasn't able to walk far, but we could wait no longer. Keeping a nice secret is very hard to do, like holding your breath. We chose to reveal all on October 8th, Doodle's sixth birthday. And for weeks ahead, we mooned around the house, promising everybody a most spectacular surprise. And Nicey said that, after so much talk, if we produced anything less tremendous than the resurrection, she was going to be disappointed. At breakfast on our chosen day, when Mama, Daddy, and Aunt Nicey were in the dining room, I brought Doodle to the door in the go-kart, just as usual, and had them turn their backs, making them cross their hearts and hope to die if they peeked. I helped Doodle up, and when he was standing alone, I let them look. There wasn't a sound as Doodle walked slowly across the room and sat down at his place at the table. Then Mama began to cry and ran over to him, hugging him and kissing him. Daddy hugged him too, so I went to Aunt Nicey, who was thanks praying in the doorway, and began to waltz her around. We danced together quite well until she came down on my big toe with her brogans hurting me so badly I thought I was crippled for life. Doodle told them it was I who had taught him to walk, so everyone wanted to hug me and I began to cry. What are you crying for? asked Daddy, but I couldn't answer. They did not know that I did it for myself. That pride, whose slave I was, spoke to me louder than all their voices, and that Doodle walked only because I was ashamed of having a crippled brother. Within a few months, Doodle had learned to walk well and his go-kart was put up in the barn loft and it is still there beside his little mahogany coffin. Now, when we roamed out together, resting often, we never turned back until our destination had been reached and to help pass the time, we took up lying. From the beginning, Doodle was a terrible liar and he got me in the habit. Had anyone stopped to listen to us, we would have been sent off to Dick's Hill. My lies were scary, involved, and usually pointless, but Doodles were twice as crazy. People in his stories all had wings and flew wherever they wanted to go. His favorite lie was about a boy named Peter who had a pet peacock with a 10-foot tail. Peter wore a golden robe that glittered so brightly that when he walked through the sunflowers, they turned away from the sun to face him. When Peter was ready to go to sleep, the peacock spread his magnificent tail, enfolding the boy gently like a closing go-to-sleep flower, burying him in the gloriously iridescent rustling vortex. Yes, I must admit it, Doodle could beat me lying. Doodle and I spent lots of time thinking about our future. We decided that when we were grown, we'd live in Old Woman's Swamp and pick dog tongue for a living. Beside the stream he planned, we'd build us a house of whispering leaves and the swamp birds would be our chickens. All day long, when we weren't gathering dog tongue, we'd swing through the cypresses on the rope vines and if it rained, we'd huddle beneath an umbrella tree and play stick frog. Mama and Daddy could come and live with us if they wanted to. He even came up with the idea that he could marry Mama and I could marry Daddy. Of course, I was old enough to know this wouldn't work out, but the picture he painted was so beautiful and serene that all I could do was whisper, yes, yes. Once I had succeeded in teaching Doodle to walk, I began to believe in my own infallibility, and I prepared a terrific development program for him, unknown to Mama and Daddy, of course. I would teach him to run, to swim, to climb trees, and to fight. 
He too now believed in my infallibility, so we set the deadline for these accomplishments less than a year away, when it had been decided Doodle could start to school. That winter, we didn't make much progress, for I was in school and Doodle suffered from one bad cold after another. But when spring came, rich and warm, we raised our sights again, success lay at the end of summer like a pot of gold, and our campaign got off to a good start. On hot days, Doodle and I went to horsehead landing, and I gave him swimming lessons or showed him how to row a boat. Sometimes we descended into the cool greenness of Old Woman's Swamp and climbed the rope vines or boxed scientifically beneath the pine where he had learned to walk. Promise hung about us like the leaves, and wherever we looked, ferns unfurled and birds broke into song. That summer, the summer of 1918, was blighted. In May and June, there was no rain, and the crops withered, curled up, then died under the thirsty sun. One morning in July, a hurricane came out of the east, tipping over the oaks in the yard and splitting the limbs of the elm trees. That afternoon, it roared back out of the west, blew the fallen oaks around, snapping their roots and tearing them out of the earth like a hawk at the entrails of a chicken. Cotton bowls were wrenched from the stalks and lay like green walnuts in the valleys between the rows, while the cornfield leaned over uniformly so that the tassels touched the ground. Doodle and I followed Daddy out into the cotton field where he stood, shoulders sagging, surveying the ruin. When his chin sank down onto his chest, we were frightened, and Doodle slipped his hand into mine. Suddenly, Daddy straightened his shoulders, raised a giant, knuckly fist, and with a voice that seemed to rumble out of the earth itself, began cursing heaven, hell, the weather, and the Republican Party. Doodle and I, prodding each other and giggling, went back to the house, knowing that everything would be all right. And during that summer, strange names were heard through the house. Chateau Thierry, Amiens, Soissons, and her blessing at the supper table. Mama once said, and blessed the Pearsons, whose boy Joe was lost at Bellow Wood. So we came to that clove of seasons. School was only a few weeks away, and Doodle was far behind schedule. He could barely clear the ground when climbing up the rope vines, and swimming was certainly not passable. We decided to double our efforts, to make that last drive and reach our pot of gold. I made him swim until he turned blue and grow until he couldn't lift an oar. Wherever we went, I purposely walked fast, and although he kept up, his face turned red and his eyes became glazed. Once, he could go no further, so he collapsed on the ground and began to cry. Aw, oh, come on, Doodle, I urged. You can do it. Do you want to be different from everybody else when you start school? Does it make any difference? It certainly does, I said. Now come on. And I helped him up. As we slipped through dog days, Doodle began to look feverish, and Mama felt his forehead asking him if he felt ill. At night, he didn't sleep well, and sometimes he had nightmares, crying out until I touched him and said, Wake up, Doodle. Wake up. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Looking to enhance your English skills while exploring a world of knowledge? Then English Plus Podcast website is just for you. Dive into diverse topics ranging from science to literature, history to business, and myths to modern insights. Each episode from our podcast or article from our magazine is a journey of learning and discovery, designed to not only improve your language skills, but also broaden your understanding of the world. Join us at English Plus Podcast, where language meets limitless learning. Tune in today and take your English to the next level. Visit EnglishPlusPodcast.com to start your journey. English Plus Podcast, language, learning, enlightenment. Never stop learning with English Plus. It was Saturday noon, just a few days before school was to start. I should have already admitted defeat, but my pride wouldn't let me. The excitement of our program had now been gone for weeks, but still we kept on with a tired doggedness. 
it was too late to turn back, for we had both wandered too far into a net of expectations and had left no crumbs behind. Daddy, Mama, Doodle, and I were seated at the dining room table having lunch. It was a hot day, with all the windows and doors open in case a breeze should come. In the kitchen, Aunt Nicey was humming softly. After a long silence, Daddy spoke. It's so calm. I wouldn't be surprised if we had a storm this afternoon. I haven't heard a rain frog, said Mama, who believed in signs as she served the bread around the table. I did, declared Doodle, down in the swamp. He didn't, I said contrarily. You did, eh? said Daddy, ignoring my denial. I certainly did, Doodle reiterated, scowling at me over the top of his iced tea glass, and we were quiet again. Suddenly, from out in the yard came a strange croaking noise. Doodle stopped eating with a piece of bread poised ready for his mouth. His eyes popped round like two blue buttons. What's that? He whispered. I jumped up, knocking over my chair, and had reached the door when Mama called, Pick up the chair, sit down again, and say excuse me. By the time I had done this, Doodle had excused himself and had slipped out into the yard. He was looking up into the bleeding tree. It's a great big red bird, he called. The bird croaked loudly again, and Mama and Daddy came out into the yard. We shaded our eyes with our hands against the hazy glare of the sun and peered up through the still leaves. On the topmost branch, a bird the size of a chicken with scarlet feathers and long legs was perched precariously. Its wings hung down loosely, and as we watched, a feather dropped away and floated slowly down through the green leaves. It's not even frightened of us, Mama said. It looks tired, Daddy added, or maybe sick. Doodle's hands were clasped at his throat, and I had never seen him stand still so long. What is it, he asked. Daddy shook his head. I, I don't know, maybe it's... Uh... At that moment, the bird began to flutter, but the wings were uncoordinated, and amid much flapping and a spray of flying feathers, it tumbled down, bumping through the limbs of the bleeding tree and landing at our foot with a thud. Its long, graceful neck jerked twice into an S, then straightened out, and the bird was still. A white veil came over the eyes, and the long white beak unhinged. Its legs were crossed and its claw-like feet were delicately curved at rest. Even death did not mar its grace, for it lay on the earth like a broken vase of red flowers, and we stood around it awed by its exotic beauty. It's dead, Mama said. What is it? Doodle repeated. Go bring me the bird book, said Daddy. I ran into the house and brought back the bird book. As we watched, Daddy thumbed through its pages, it's a scarlet ibis, he said, pointing to a picture. It lives in the tropics, South America to Florida. A storm must have brought it here. Sadly, we all looked back at the bird, a scarlet ibis. How many miles it had traveled to die like this in our yard beneath the bleeding tree. Let's finish lunch, Mama said, nudging us back toward the dining room. I'm not hungry, said Doodle, and he knelt down beside the ibis. We've got peach cobbler for dessert, Mama tempted from the doorway. Doodle remained kneeling. I'm going to bury him. Don't you dare touch him, Mama warned. There's no telling what disease he might have had. All right, said Doodle. I won't. Daddy, Mama, and I went back to the dining room table, but we watched Doodle through the open door. He took out a piece of string from his pocket and, without touching the ibis, looped one end around its neck. Slowly, while singing softly, shall we gather at the river, he carried the bird around to the front yard and dug a hole in the flower garden next to the petunia bed. Now we were watching him through the front window, but he didn't know it. His awkwardness at digging the hole with a shovel whose handle was twice as long as he was made us laugh, and we covered our mouths with our hands so he wouldn't hear. When Doodle came into the dining room, he found us seriously eating our cobbler. He was pale and lingered just inside the screen door. Did you get the scarlet ibis buried? asked Daddy. Doodle didn't speak but nodded his head. Go wash your hands and then you can have some peach cobbler, said Mama. I'm not hungry, he said. Dead birds is bad luck, said Aunt Nicey, poking her head from the kitchen door. Especially red dead birds. As soon as I had finished eating, Doodle and I hurried off to Horsehead Landing. Time was short and Doodle still had a long way to go if he was going to keep up with the other boys when he started school. The sun, gilded with the yellow cast of autumn, still burned fiercely, 
but the dark green woods through which we passed were shady and cool. When we reached the landing, Doodle said he was too tired to swim, so we got into a skiff and floated down the creek with the tide. Far off in the marsh, a rail was scolding, and over on the beach, locusts were singing in the myrtle trees. Doodle did not speak and kept his head turned away, letting one hand trail limply in the water. After we had drifted a long way, I put the oars in place and made Doodle row back against the tide. Black clouds began to gather in the southwest, and he kept watching them, trying to pull the oars a little faster. When we reached Horsehead Landing, lightning was playing across half the sky and thunder roared out, hiding even the sound of the sea. The sun disappeared and darkness descended, almost like night. Flocks of marsh crows flew by, heading inland to their roosting trees, and two egrets squawking arose from the oyster rock shallows and careened away. Doodle was both tired and frightened, and when he stepped from the skiff he collapsed onto the mud, sending an armada of fiddler crabs rustling off into the marsh grass. I helped him up, and as he wiped the mud off his trousers, he smiled at me ashamedly. He had failed, and we both knew it. So we started back home, racing the storm. We never spoke. What are the words that consoled our cracked pride? But I knew he was watching me, watching for a sign of mercy. The lightning was near now, and from fear he walked so close behind me he kept stepping on my heels. The faster I walked, the faster he walked. So I began to run. The rain was coming, roaring through the pines, and then, like a bursting Roman candle, a gum tree ahead of us was shattered by a bolt of lightning. When the deafening peal of thunder had died, and in the moment before the rain arrived, I heard Doodle, who had fallen behind, cry out, Brother! Brother! Don't leave me! Don't leave me! The knowledge that Doodle's and my plans had come to naught was bitter, and that streak of cruelty within me awakened. I ran as fast as I could, leaving him far behind with a wall of rain dividing us. The drop stung my face like nettles, and the wind flared the wet, glistening leaves of the bordering trees. Soon I could hear his voice no more. I hadn't run too far before I became tired, and the flood of childish spite evanesced as well. I stopped and waited for Doodle. The sound of rain was everywhere, but the wind had died and it felt straight down in parallel paths like ropes hanging from the sky. As I waited, I peered through the downpour, but no one came. Finally, I went back and found him huddled beneath a red nightshade bush beside the road. He was sitting on the ground, his face buried in his arms, which were resting on his drawn-up knees. Let's go, Doodle, I said. He didn't answer. So I placed my hand on his forehead and lifted his head. Limply, he fell backward onto the earth. He had been bleeding from the mouth, and his neck and the front of his shirt were stained a brilliant red. Doodle! Doodle! I cried, shaking him. But there was no answer but the ropey rain. He lay very awkwardly, with his head thrown far back, making his vermilion neck appear unusually long and slim. His little legs bent sharply at the knees, and never before seemed so fragile so thin. I began to weep, and the terror blurred vision in red before me looked very familiar. Doodle! I screamed above the pounding storm and threw my body to the earth above his. For a long, long time, it seemed forever, I lay there crying, sheltering my fallen scarlet ibis from the heresy of rain. So that was the story of the Scarlet Ibis. I know it's a sad story, but there are a lot of things that we can think about, especially the thing that I started with about cruelty and how we can be cruel to the ones we really love. And why do we do that? Is it part of love or whatever it is? These are just questions that come to mind when we think about a story like this one. 
It is a beautiful story, a sad one, I agree, but it is a beautiful story. I hope you like it as much as I do. And with that, we come to the end of our episode. Don't forget that you can read the story if you want while listening to my reading to it on my website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. The link is in the description. And please support me on Patreon. There's another link in the description. You can go to Patreon, support me there to keep English Plus and all the other projects that I do alive. With that being said, this is your host, Danny. Thank you very much for listening to another episode from English Plus Podcast. I will see you next time.